Today at the Writers' Gym, I'm interviewed by, as well as interviewing, my guest. Trevor Kennedy is a DJ and the editor of Phantasmagoria magazine. He's a big part of the same horror community as me, and ahead of the launch of my new collection, Twisted Branches, for Black Shuck Books, we talk about everything from how we got to writing, to the things that stood in the way of writing, to imposter syndrome, to making your writing life work for you. I'm very pleased and honoured to be joined by Dr. Rachel Knightley, who is a horror author and she is also a university lecturer and much, much more. So, Rachel, it's great to chat as always and thanks for taking the time. What are you currently working on? Thank you for having me. I am currently working on Twisted Branches, which is my second short story collection for Black Shuck Books. And I think I just started on that when you and I were on a panel at a festival last year at Chillicon. Yes, in Scarborough. Yes. Yes. And what's been so wonderful about that is my background in coaching comes from theatre. And I know we we have that in common. That something that has just always absolutely fascinated me is the power of the stories we tell ourselves. And I discovered that through theatre and how motivation, what you want and the obstacles that you perceive are so much about who you are. And the way that an actor works out their character is by working out what do they want. And it's been quite a circuitous route, but coming to coaching and realising that, you know, as the way that I'd always directed whether that was for theatre itself or whether that was Lambda exams, public speaking, acting, reading for performance. It's all about your intention. And if you're motivated by fear, what if my hair looks terrible? What if I forget my lines? It doesn't come from a place of authenticity. It doesn't come from a place of, of being about what your questions are, what you're trying to say into the world. And coaching helps you find what that is, just as a good director for theatre helps you find out what that is. It's not about saying, you need to move your arm like this at this point. Yes. It's about saying, who are you? What do you want? And so even though the book is not about theatre, the perception and reality relationship and how that plays out in families is, I think, truly, genuinely horrific that we have so much yeah. lack of understanding of when our fear is driving us quite a lot of the time and how those relationships intertwine for good or bad. So the way that I've talked about Twisted Branches is it's an extended family and how they knowingly and unknowingly mess up and light up each other's lives. Yes. So it's, yeah. it's the basic horror in that however much you love someone, in fact, maybe the more that you love someone, the more you're capable of standing in your own way of who you are and who you want to be with them. Indeed. And the sort of the horrors of the real world would be very much, you know, day to day life with our families, with <laughs> our friends, as opposed to maybe vampires and werewolves and ghosts, you know, type thing. Yeah. I mean, any any monster is a metaphor for something that is absolutely real. And I suppose that has always been my interest in, you know, what, what are the stories that we tell ourselves and can we be, become more than those stories? So on my podcast on the Writer's Gym, I was talking to another coach recently about exactly that, that when you say the thing, when you bring it into the world, you know what it is. But I'm writing about characters who don't do that. It's far too embarrassing. and It's far too scary to explore those emotions. So let's push them right down yeah. and pretend they're not there. And, you know, all <laughs> excitement ensues, horror ensues, because we're denying who we are. And that is when we become the monster version of ourselves. Indeed. Indeed. I would agree with that. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah, you were really discussing there about your upcoming new collection, Twisted Branches, which is on the way. Could you tell us a little more about it, please? Like um, when it will be released and where it will be available from and, st and anything else, really? Any, any spoilers or anything like that? Sure. OK, yeah. It's going to be out on the 26th of October. That's the official release date. There is going to be a launch in London. I don't yet know if that's the Friday or Saturday, so maybe there will be a pro postscript to that soon. But I'm, I'm going to be doing a little online tour of... Of, of blogs on Instagram and yeah. I'm doing a members event for Olympic Studios which is my my local club where I see some of my coaches my writers and people building confidence for life work and art that's happening there so there will be a week of stuff going on around that and more of that soon I hope in terms of other things about it you can pre-order it from Black Shuck Books right now which would be lovely if you do yeah. so you just just go to blackshuckbooks.co.uk and would it be featured on your own website or anything like yeah, yeah, absolutely. Some of the stuff that I've been talking about just now, you can see a lot more about that and you can see how the themes fit in with other stuff that interests me at rachelnightly.com. So that's R-A-C-H-E-L. And can they follow you on social media as well? They absolutely can. Dr. Rachel Knightley, Instagram, Facebook, threads now. Yes. And Twitter, not so much because I'm 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 there, but my name on Twitter is Dr. Rachel Knightley is really on Instagram or words. Yes. But yeah. Dr. R. Knightley at, at 
Twitter as well and LinkedIn. So you name it, you can come and say hi and do say hi because it's always great to know what interests people. And from the coaching point of view and the writing point of view, it is really good to hear about about what, what is chiming with people. So do say hi. Cool. And in 2021, you also released your collection Beyond Glass. Thematically, yeah. what was that book about? There's a lot in common in terms of perception and reality, but one of the ways in which what it was about sort of had a kind of extra lease of life none of us banked on was that I released it during lockdown. Yeah. And although I spend a lot of time broadcasting and videos for coaching now and for, and for social media and Starburst magazine, obviously I've done series for them. Mm-hmm. A lot of that was new technologically at the time. I did not know that you could not charge your phone and it not go the other way up. You know the way when you plug the phone and you have to balance yeah. it on its head. So for the first couple of seconds of my book launch, I was upside down and I went, <laughs> okay, I see what's happening. Because you know how it normally writes itself on other yeah. programs. This yes. is one of those wonderful learning moments where you go, I now know there's something I didn't know there. It's not a catastrophe. It's really funny. Yeah. Shared that with somebody. And I, I had someone else say, oh, if I, that would be me. I'd have been so embarrassed. And I thought, who cares? You know, it's funny. Let's carry on. And I, I I think being able to just enjoy that sort of laugh with people about it carry on I feel like the things that I was writing about were really key to the lockdown experience that you you don't ask for these things life throws some really hideous stuff at it and we get confronted with our own powerlessness and it's not about oh there's meaning in everything or anything like that it's more about sometimes it's not through everything going brilliantly that we do discover our own power so the the image of of beyond glass a lot of the stories are windows a lot of the stories are mirrors and it all revolves around which is which in a way that i i would argue that things like Instagram, yes, they can do a lot of harm depending on your mindset. But if you think about what it is you want, so again, coming back to the objectives and the obstacles, if you're motivated by what do I want and what do I want to be, then it can, I'm, I'm only saying can, doesn't always work like this and I know that, yes. but it can help you take a step towards that. So an example of that I've been doing this month is the creative commute that I realised when I was editing Twisted Branches, that if I take myself away from the computer to the sofa and I read a book for half an hour or an hour or I do notes on something else which to be honest is a circle writing reading it tends to feed into itself yeah and I, I've noticed through that that I come back to the computer mentally refreshed. If I've gone somewhere else mentally and I come back, I am fresher and more used to myself, if I can put it like that, yeah. than if I hadn't done that. But dear God, the discipline of being able to step away when you've got something really coming at you and there's a big deadline. It's so hard, isn't it? So absolutely, making myself do that and seeing the response that I get from myself. I actually made myself accountable to Instagram and threads. I went, this is my creative commute. I'm doing it. And yes, you're advertising. Yes, it's 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 that kind of communication, but it's also communication with yourself. It's something that you use as a kind of external reality of a kind yeah. that allows you to go tick. I've done that. That means I can do it tomorrow. That means I can do it the time after. I think I probably got that through physiotherapy because I have dyspraxia and various coordination issues and yeah. I text my physiotherapist an emoji when I've done a certain exercise each day and he will text back and go yeah or, or fire you're on fire it's great you know and that makes me be more likely to have the strong habits that I need and it makes me healthier so perception and reality is kind of what all these things are about for me isn't it great how I did that with no spoilers yeah exactly I I yeah said... and I would certainly subscribe to what you were saying about you know whenever terrible things happen in life which happen to us all at times mm-hmm. but um, ironically I suppose suppose they in the long run if we survive them they make us much stronger people mm-hmm. with with hopefully a better perspective on life and sort of more of a sort of a real a, a real sort of outlook on life if you know what I mean yeah. I think that's absolutely right and again I'll, I'll try and do this without spoilers but I think one of the most important things to me about Beyond Glass one of the stories was based on a what if that was a stalking situation that right. um, the partner as it turned out I'd thought ex-partner of a person that I was with who I'm Jewish lifelong and to see my history of physical violence was following me in the street a couple of times and what happens in the book did not happen yes but of course. it was me realizing what if so there's a b- bunch of things going on what if the i'm trying to do this without spoilers isn't it so hard yeah yeah what if the worst things that i knew from the police were an option that could have happened did happen but also what if i had certain people in my life that meant i was supported in a way that i felt i needed at the time and the whole story is about that opportunity and crisis double edged sword coin depending on how you're feeling that day and that for me is a bunch of questions i desperately wanted to ask that what it came to and this and I'll tell you 
the bit that was real and that continues to fascinate me to mm-hmm. this day. I mean, it was much more emotional at the time, but I'm sure very, very interesting to me is I represented pure evil to the woman who was following me because she saw me as being with the man that she was with. That wasn't my yeah. impression when I went into it, but I was Jewish. I was a teacher, which was something she wanted to be. And she saw me as pure evil, as having taken what was hers. And as somebody who was who I knew was anti-Semitic, I have emails that the police is, um, the bit that yeah. is true is I have emails that the police system couldn't take because the, the language in it, the system rejected it. So I was standing next to a policeman who right. read the emails, unable to send them. That is how bad it was. You know, so we represented true evil to each other. And I, even as that was going on, I thought, well, there's a story there. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, um, well, it's like you yeah. say about the what ifs. And I think a lot yeah. of fear comes from what ifs. You know, it's like mm-hmm. the fear of the unknown, even yeah. not even in a supernatural sense, but in life in general, it's about, you know, certainly with myself, it would be fears and worries about things that haven't happened or, you know, the worst case scenarios, as you discussed, you know, mm-hmm. sort of imagining them in our heads, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. There's definitely that in there is the worst case scenario. But I think there's also, I think for me, and I think for a lot of people who are interested in communication and writing, the experience of being misrepresented. Yes, of course. Yeah. Is a kind of horror is, but that's not yeah. me, is looking in what somebody else's vision of you is. So again, with the mirrors and the windows. Yes, Seeing absolutely. that from somebody else's point of view. Again, perce- perception and reality, I guess. Um, yeah. But what what I think for me also was going on there was the one kind of sense I can make of things that, as you know, as 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 much as I'm talking about it now very calmly, wasn't at yeah. the time, and you know, and it was very out. real. It wasn't a what if, yeah, yeah. 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 Certain things were going on. Certain things were what ifs. And, the, the emails and, were real, and yeah. the the, the, well, the stopping and all that were very real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what wasn't though was the no actually that's a spoiler so I'm not going to say that okay what I will say instead (laughs) is it was really for me about testament that the meaning that we find in the terrible things that do happen to us yeah is is the is what we come forward with so what I came forward with is again it's coming back to what I was saying earlier say the thing that the person I I was with at the time didn't want me to tell the police because he thought it was going to make the situation worse. And my brain went, well, that's that's bullying. That's letting the monster win. And I'm absolutely programmed to not do that. So I went into a bit of rescuer mode. I wasn't trained as a coach then, so I didn't know what I was doing. And you can't do that if somebody basically doesn't want to be rescued. It doesn't work. It's got to, as as, you know, we've talked about in other things of life, the person's got to save themselves. They've got to be at that point, be ready to do that, be, be open to that. So I suppose because of that, the one piece of control, if you like, that you do have is over your own behavior and telling your story and say the thing. And because that way, whoever has that problem next along the line, you might have saved somebody else's life. And where there's domestic violence involved, yeah. that can be absolutely literal. So there's a responsibility there. Now, I've I've had people in my writing pre-career, <laughs> I couldn't even call it a career at that point, going, there's too much of you in there. And I took that to mean literally there's too much of you in there when I was much younger, rather than yeah. you haven't worked out why you're saying it yet. It's not about how much of you is in there. It's about, do you know what you're trying to do with it? Do you know what you're trying to say with it? It's not just look at me, validate me. It yes. is what is the message beneath that? Yes. And I think we're, we're all on that journey and it can always be difficult to find but following what your questions are about the world yeah does let you find that yeah so that that's been something that's been quite important to me oh no I would totally agree with that and a lot of the time you know whenever we write there'll be a significant part of ourselves in our writing uh, quite a significant part but it's about the way we sort of you know bring it forward you know what I mean like you say it's not about oh look at me this you know it's about you know about the issues that we're writing about and sort of bringing them to the fore you know? Absolutely. I think um, Neil Gaiman's image has always worked for me of the compost heap, that what goes on it is not the same as what comes up through it. So yes. I, I do quotes books. I love writing down things people have said where you think, oh, that's funny. I remember that. And you never do. So I've got books of those going back years, but it never goes into the writing in the form that it entered. The yes, notebook. I know what it's, you mean. It all, it's always coming back as something of itself, of its own. Yeah. What first attracted you to the horror genre and ultimately to, to become a horror writer? I think we've sort of touched on some of this already, but um, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> well, the confession would be that I thought that I didn't like horror. I was one of that long, long, long queue, despite the fact that I was, you know, fairly goth and had grown up on the gothic literature and specialised in that at university. I still thought that horror was people's limbs falling off and boring things, which are yeah. both gross and, you know, still not that way 
I'm not on that bit, but the spooky stories and the what haunts people has been what I was fascinated in from, in literature from the word go. I just didn't realise the whole thing was a spectrum or a broad church, as yes. people are fond of saying. Um, for me, it's a goth spectrum, it's a horror spectrum, but broad church works just as well. And what happened was I was internet dating once the whole stalking thing had, you know, kind of cooled down a bit. And yeah. I was back out in the world and I I met my now partner and you know, he he knew I liked a lot of the things that I liked. And I thought I didn't like horror films. Um, yes, I now have reviewed them and written them. And yeah, I know it's ridiculous. You've been it's, converted? It's less, less than a decade ago. <laughs> I don't think it was that. I yeah, think it, yeah. was, it was a case yeah. of, of relabeling and a bit more self-knowledge. But anyway, what happened was he dared me. He dared me yeah. to write a horror story. It came first in the Dearly Departed Writers Forum magazine fiction Excellent. competition. Yeah. It's called Wolf in the Mirror. It's in Beyond Glass. I re-edited a little bit for that. But it made me go, oh, actually, the literature of fear is what horror is. And if somebody had called horror way back at the beginning, the literature of fear, like romance, is the literature of romance. <laughs> I think our PR issues would be completely different and much easier because the minute you go, it's it's fear fiction, it's the literature of fear. Oh, I see why that's healthy. Oh, I see why that's interesting. Oh, I see how that leads into coaching. But the word horror, the angle that that takes, yes. dot, 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 you know, maybe I'd have turned up earlier. <laughs> yeah, yes, I, I I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So as we've all already sort of discussed a bit as well, you're a writing and confidence coach. What exactly is a writing and confidence coach? What I'm doing is using my business and personal coaching qualification in conjunction yep. with the creative writing PhD and yep. history as a freelancer of 15 years. Because I was already running the writer's gym. I was already working with published authors, developing writers of all kinds, sometimes people who have never published anything, barely written anything for themselves, who are interested and want to see what else they are capable of. And it does not matter how much you've already done or how little, that's a process that we all want to engage in. So really, I, I took the qualification because I wanted to support the people I was already working with as well as I possibly could. And what that branding now, writing and confidence is all about, is it's finding the clarity that becomes the focus that becomes the confidence that if you're interested in where your voice is taking you it's like oh I wonder what's around the next corner not what does so and so think or I'm not as good as so and so or any of any of the sort of obstacles that get in our way but what am I interested in if you follow that you'll get your first draft and if you're open to developing that you'll get your publisher it's going to happen but it is about how you work with yourself Yes. So all life, work, art, choices and coaching are about that. And it starts with curiosity. It starts with with having enough sense of self rather than the infinite mirrors all around us. What do I want? That's what it starts with. And that is what I do. Cool. Excellent. And you also, as again, we've already sort of touched on, have a background in theatre, acting and directing. How did you find this type of work? I know it's one of your main backgrounds, I believe. And do you still work in it in any form? I started in a youth theatre in West London as a teenager. And I was very, very shy as a teenager. And I had friends there and it was all lovely. And I spent time in that community until my, I was directing there until my early 30s. So 10, getting on for 10 years ago now. And I loved it as a community, a bit, a bit like our horror writers yeah. are to me, to me now. But it's something that you, you don't get paid for, not that that's the point, but it, it's not the full career so it was it was something I was doing on the side but then age 25 I lost a friend to cancer who'd been in my yeah. in my youth theatre group mm -hmm. and I wanted a bunch of people at her funeral said let's do a show in memory of her and I had a feeling that if I didn't push this this probably wasn't going to happen but that's what really actually changed my entire life was forming a theatre company to raise money for Macmillan Cancer Support in my friend's memory. Now I'd written a bit for different theatre companies yes. and I'd had I'd had plays on and things like that. But the way that it's most relevant, as much as you know the, the plays were were lovely and I had some one act things put on and various things happened. But what it was really about for me was I did I did a play it was a Terry Pratchett play in memory of this friend and for her chosen charity and what that then became was new writing events for Macmillan Cancer Support every year and it's also now in memory of two of my uncles because there's a big history of cancer in my family and, yes yeah um, my yeah. grandfather as well uh, so that was how that started I left a very sensible job in copywriting which I was hating <laughs> um, my 
thank God, fam family encouragement saying, you, yeah, it's volunteering, you're not getting paid for it, but it doesn't mean it's not a job. Make it be a job, do what you want to do with your life. If I had not had it, really my mother's su support emotionally and in my yes. 20s financially to get that going, the sponsored right that, that now exists would never have happened. So every year what happens now is I unite a bunch of published writers and developing writers from my coaching community and everybody writes on a theme that is something to do with quality of life because that's Macmillan Cancer Support's mission. So these days what I do is I ask an author of note to give us a title around that. So this year we have the lovely Paul Tremblay and what we have here is Paul's title, A Well of Strength, The Strength of Will. Well. And we had a long conversation about, about um, whether it was stroke or comma. He likes the comma, so we went with, or, right. <laughs> always, always pick what, what the author in, author's intentions are. Yeah. So, you know, I, I won't comment on what I see in that title because every writer who's involved in it will see something different in that title. And as with all creative writing, there is no wrong answer. A writing yes. prompt gets your brain to pick a lane and have the confidence of going forward with that. And that is is what it's all about. So that is Green Ink Sponsored Right. Excellent. Good stuff. Uh, great. Um, and very worthwhile work as well. And apart from the upcoming collection, and of course this as well, A Well of Strength, The Strength of Will, what other upcoming projects do you have on the go? Um, may I just answer that question by repeating the website for this one before I yes. say anything? Yes, oh, sorry, my, my apologies. Yes, go ahead. Yes. <laughs> no, 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 it's fine. And before the internet kicks, kicks us off, you're meeting in nine minutes. Yes. What I want to say is justgiving.com forward slash Green Ink Sponsored Right 2023. And the more people can donate, share that link with their friends, family and ultimate universes, yes. I cannot begin to tell you the difference it makes for quality of life, which is all any of us has in the end, yeah. is what you do with the time that you have. Great. What was the question, Trevor? Sorry, yes. <laughs> <laughs> what other oh. upcoming projects do you have on the go? Oh, so there is something I have just started, but it's so early, I'd feel like I was jinxing it if I said it, but it, it may possibly be drama related. Right. And that is all I will say for now. Okay, yep. Sounds <laughs> intriguing. Yep, I'll look forward but to I, I hope people more will go it. and pre-order Twisted Branches. That would be fantastic. Yep. Uh, that's on Black Shark Books' website. And please do come and come and look at the sponsored right and follow me on Instagram. You'll see all of those things there. Good stuff. Go and check out uh, Dr. Rachel Knightley's social media accounts and website along with the rest. So thank you very much, Rachel. It's been great to chat to you. Thank you. It's been great to chat to you. Did you want me to mention a song? Yes. Would you like a song played? Do you know, I was thinking about this and the thing that came to my mind is definitely not going to be the mainstream which is you want it darker by leonard cohen brilliant i i come from a jewish background where it's not about what you believe it's about what you in in the is god literal city on a cloud sense it's about what you do and leonard leonard cohen just brilliant songwriter brilliant brilliant poet captures what it is to be living with the beautiful and the divine and the appalling yeah. and how none, none of this makes sense and all of the anger and seeing the love and the beauty yeah. anyway. But the relationship between storytelling and living is something that he does amazingly well. And when he also knew he was terminal at that point, yes. you want it darker. That's the album title and the song title. I'm just looking at it over yeah. there. I could probably almost reach it, but maybe that's a bit too much advertising. Yes. But that would that album and that song, that title song. Yeah, well, this is um, not a mainstream show, I have to say. And Leonard <laughs> Indeed. Cohen. Yeah, More Leonard horror. Cohen. Features he's the perfect horror poet, isn't he? Yeah, oh no, he's fantastic. The late great poet and musician, obviously, and lyricist um, Leonard Cohen, certainly. I will just so, lean to the side and get David Bowie in there as well. For oh, those yeah, another it. one. Another, yeah. another one who features yeah. regularly on the show oh so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> along with many other legends <laughs> yeah. all of black star as well that's my second one. <laughs> but you want uh, it darker and black star spot the goth <laughs> yeah exactly yeah and i'm quite the radio head fan here as well so mm -hmm. i don't know if you're into them but yeah i do like my dark sort of heavy stuff <laughs> let's excellent. just say excellent yeah. but uh yeah. yep great stuff rachel thank you thank you it's been so much yep. fun thank you so much Trevor. yes tell me about you and writing and how you found each other right it's a bit of a, a strange sort of journey for me I suppose um i mean all of our journeys are unique but um when i was a kid i was very bookish i loved reading but i also loved films and tv shows all for the most part um of the weird variety sort of horror and you know fantasy science fiction that sort of thing but I loved reading and, you know, I was quite good at writing also as a kid. I was doing very, I did very well um, with reading and writing in primary school. 
But the problem was the crowd I run about with and the school I went to, things like reading and writing weren't very weren't seen as cool, you know. <laughs> and you know, at that age I just wanted to fit in um and be, you know, good at the cool things like football and stuff. So Throughout my school life, you know, in primary school and sort of, um, you know, secondary school, there was always this sort of struggle. While I, you know, always did a lot of sort of reading and writing and watching of films and, you know, TV shows and stuff, I also really wanted to fit in with the cool crowd as well, who I run, a, who I run about with, you know, who were my friends and still are to this day. So there was also always that internal sort of conflict with me. Wanting to fit in on one hand, but at the same time following my passions. So it was sort of, I was doing both. And, um, you know, I would still argue to this day the stuff I was doing back then and doing now was the real cool stuff. Yeah. <laughs> but um, there was always, uh, yeah, it was always sort of, it was a bit of a delicate balance, I suppose. I used to write quite a bit, you know, horror stories whenever I was a kid. Um, I loved reading sort of horror books books and you know horror magazines lovecraft stephen king magazines like fear fantasy tales i was a big fan of the fight and fantasy role-playing game books and loads more there was other sort of uh, a lot of the stuff i read and watched as a kid was not age appropriate but um, again it, it was a case where i could even back then totally differentiate between fact and fiction you know and you know, I, I knew it wasn't real. It was, you know, ultimately, you know, it wasn't a real monster. It was somebody in makeup in this film, you know. So what, what were the non-age appropriate ones that stuck with you? Well, as a small uh, sort of primary school kid, some of my favourite films were the Evil Dead films and the Hellraiser films. <laughs> yeah. uh, that's not a joke. <laughs> you know, uh, my mum, who sort of grew up and sort of introduced me to Hammer films and stuff like that, they're the Triffids, she was sort of of the mindset that, you know, she was still sort of thought that horror films were maybe not quite more more in the tone of Hammer and stuff, uh, uh, quite gentle. And she just encouraged me sort of creativity. But I don't think she quite realized how sort of uh, maybe hardcore some of these films I was watching were. But she ultimately, she thought they were harmless. And, and I would agree with her for me anyway. I know that some kids, even my sisters at the time, it wouldn't have been appropriate for them and it would have freaked them out. But uh, they younger or? They were uh, both younger. One would have been two years younger than me. Well, still is, obviously. <laughs> and the other one is five years younger than me. So while they were in the sort of Barbie dolls and Cindy dolls and things like, you know, Disney, you know, Disney princesses and stuff, I my sort of bedroom walls were covered in things like Freddy Krueger, um, Pinhead, you know, Evil Dead, stuff like that, and all these horror books. But generally my family were just of the opinion, you know, it shuts them up for a while. You just let them do it, you know. You know. And was the writing happening in conjunction with that? Were you imagining yeah, your own yeah. version? Yeah, I, I used to sort of, I whenever I was, again, in primary school, technically I wrote my first book. <laughs> and, and I also made an attempt at writing a fight and fantasy game book as well. I think I was only aged about eight or so. And um, the, the first book that I wrote, it was a, a, obviously a horror book, horror story. And uh, my dad worked in a printing firm. You know, he was a printer all his life. And I, not understanding the cost of lithographic printing at the time, and, you know, I asked him to get it printed for me. <laughs> so, again, to keep me quiet, because I was a very enthusiastic kid, especially about all of this stuff. So I think basically to shut me up, he got my handwritten story and illustrated by myself, photocopied several times and stapled together. And I then handed it around the doors of, you know, my neighbours and stuff. You know, I was only like seven or eight, but it was all very over the top. And there was vampires, werewolves and, you know, ghouls and zombies and stuff in it. Um, it was it was called Ghosts Run Wild. <laughs> so if you put Ghosts Run Wild on a table next to the latest issue of Phantasmagoria, do yes. you see family resemblance between what you're actually publishing and editing? Yes, I do. Uh, Absolutely. Well, basically, yeah. There is a, a strong, strong connection there. But once I got into my sort of later things, you know, I was still writing stories in, in you know, secondary school and stuff. But once uh, I started up my own horror club and um, I used to rent out my horror books and videotapes to the members of my horror club. And everybody had, um, you know, a membership card with a monster on it and stuff. And so you were already an entrepreneur at the age of what? 
yes, at the age of like 12, 13, I used to rent out the videos to the teachers as well. <laughs> I went to quite a sort of good grammar school. Essentially, I come from uh, a working class background, but uh, I passed my 11 plus English and you know history and art were my best subjects. So I went to a very good school. It was quite strict, you know, and had all these societies that were very highbrow, you know, it's like the, the rowing club and the fencing club and the debating society. And I was like, well, fuck that. Where's the horror club? <laughs> you know, <laughs> so there wasn't a horror club. And so I started up my own one back then at, at the school. It was very MRGMs, almost Etonian, the school. But to be fair, although that you were supposed to jump through loops to start up your own societies and stuff with the school and had to go through teachers, they sort of give me a bye ball. I think, again, to shut me up, but also to sort of encourage me. <laughs> but as I sort of progressed into my later things, I started getting other sort of um, hobbies, um, let's just say, sort of, you know, the whole club and culture and partying. So long story short, again, anything I enjoy, I will always sort of go full on with it, let's just say. And I would have quite, um, um, well, a very addictive personality. So um, basically, long story short, in my 20s, um, early 20s and stuff, whenever I was, you know, sort of indulging in all of that sort of lifestyle, I, it caused me a lot of problems. And um, however, um, you know, I'll, I'll not go into detail and not sort of bore people. I'm sure they can sort of guess. There were a lot of issues that happened, you know, through my drinking especially, but my other sort of um, partying lifestyle choices, let's just say. But in my 30s, I started sort of dabbling back in writing again and stuff like that. And um, um, again, long story short, it was a case of after trying many things, I essentially had to return to, to gain recovery. I had to return to the kid that I was before I get into all of this other stuff um, and return to essentially my old self. You know, that very enthusiastic kid and quite creative and into all the horror stuff properly. I mean, I would have still read and watched sort of horror films and science fiction and stuff, just not as much as I would have, you know, back then and perhaps should have. And I think do now. But can I ask you about that? Because you said about coming back to that child who knew that they were a writer. Yes. Was that thinking sort of offered to you or is that is that your interpretation of what needed to happen because it it does make a lot of sense to me that we lose something along the way yeah and going back to find it is a very important process yes yeah i yeah i would um yeah i would agree with that um so we're all with me um it's um it was basically it was a decision that i eventually came to i tried many things to get sober essentially and um ultimately it just crept up on me and I think it was subconscious, but conscious at the same time, um, you know, at the, at the season. And I, I was sort of gradually dipping my toe into writing again and doing creative projects. And I have to say, I was quite ring rusty, um, you know, so I had to sort of, you know, and it's like anything, it's a process, you know, and, you know, and it, it always will be, it always will be a journey for me. But I essentially what saved me from myself was returning to my old self, that, um, you know, that sort of 12, 13-year-old boy that was, you know, flogging videotapes in school and sort of <laughs> writing these over-the-top, ridiculous sort of horror stories with no no restraint whatsoever showing you, essentially just looking to shock people. But, but you um, know what, that, that's a skill in itself, isn't it? To, to yes. be able to write without restraint, which I talk about in terms of curiosity. Yeah. With, with writing coaching, what it all comes down to in the end is getting the obstacles out of our own way so that we're in touch with our curiosity rather than our, what does yes. this say about me or what does so-and-so think, you know, being yeah. able to see what you actually want to see on the page. And it feels like you've, it feels to me like you've really connected with that 13-year-old and what that 13-year-old wanted. Yeah. yeah, oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, but to go back to your um, question about, you know, looking at my sort of, early writings as a kid and you know uh, or and the latest issue of phantasmagoria is there a connection absolutely maybe a bit more polished but there is definitely that sort of enthusiasm that i've always had for for the genre even in my sort of dark days i would have still been watching some of the latest releases and stuff 
I was just, um, I wasn't able to give it my full undivided attention as I do now because I was too busy struggling with a real life horror story, you know, and, you know, there was a lot of upset caused and, you know, I caused a lot of upset and, you know, there was, I had major issues that I had to get right with myself, you know, and, you know, as always, I will be a work in progress, you know, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm now, so we're four years now, um, we're coming up to four years completely and, um, you know, no, no going back, you know, I mean, I'm just, um, I'm loving what I'm doing. Yes. I mean, it's like any aspect of life, you've good days and bad days, and sometimes you're not in the mood for things, but overall, if I look back um, to where I was 10 years ago compared to now, it's it's night and day. It really is. I don't know if this is too much me reading my own agenda into it. However, yes. something that I find enormously encouraging is when I talk to people about how looking themselves in the eye, working out what changes need to happen, improves their writing and their connection to their writing. Because I think there's often a fear with people that actually what what people do tend to do is try and suppress things about themselves and think I can't look in that box and I talk about just how much energy goes into sort of leaning on that box sweat pouring off you to try to keep the box shut but what you've talked about is being you you use the phrase open book yeah being open I mean I don't want to say comfortable I don't want to put words in your mouth but but from where I'm sitting comfortable with what your journey has been what you've needed to face about yourself and that certainly for me and it feels like for you improves your writing improves your writing life yeah i I, I would 100 percent agree with that Mm -hmm. um for me anyway with my situation i had to look at myself in the mirror and basically warts and all and you know and there was major sort of issues that had to be that i had to resolve in my life and the only one that could do them i mean there was all sorts of help offered to me over the years but the only one that could really do it ultimately was myself. So I had to, and don't get me wrong, I'm not by any means knocking the sort of help that I've been given because it has been literally life-saving. But um, yeah, for me, it was more of a, a case of I had to look myself in the mirror and be completely honest with myself. But also even um, within recovery, um, do that on a regular, I have to do that on a regular basis where I maybe there's a situation arrives and then, you know, once it's, sort of resolved I have to um, think to myself how did I handle that did I handle that okay was I honest was I genuine with people you know could I have been better within that situation whatever the situation may be and you know uh, what what I have learned as well that um, life is a continual learning process every every day really is a school day you know and it's um and it really once I sort of accepted that and realized that, you know, I, I'll, I'll never get perfection. And you know what I mean? So it's a, it's a case of just learning and trying my very best. And, you know, mm-hmm. and ultimately taking the rough the rough with the smooth and ho- hoping, you know, that just, uh, yeah, it's, it's a matter of, you know, just putting your faith that everything will work out okay. And and also, um, I would say, counting my blessings and being very, remembering to be very, very grateful for everything that has happened to me and everything I have in my life, my family and friends and people within our field, you know, and being very grateful for all of that because a lot of people in, um, in life, in all aspects of life, you know, they're getting it a hell of a lot worse than I ever got it. So I have to remember that and, I remember how lucky I am, you know. Um, but, but with gratitude also comes recognition of what you have brought to that because the outside world can give you every support in, yes. in the cosmos and you might still not be in a position to stand up and accept it when you need it. So that along with gratitude comes that sort of recognition, I think. Yes, I, I know what you mean, yeah. Definitely. And I used I used to have, a, certainly in recent years, and as part of my sort of you know process of recovery, I would have had a, a lot of regrets about my past, stupid things that I'd done, but also um, things like, you know, um, basically messing around at school too much and not studying hard. School, I just treated school like like secondary school anyway, like like a youth club. 
and I didn't knuckle down and I didn't, you know, try for my exams. I basically failed school um, and had amazing opportunities that back then that I didn't take because I was, you know, too busy, you know, wanting to hang out with my friends or go to parties or go to discos and this sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And this was before even, you know, the whole sort of hardcore clubbing stuff came along. But I mean, it's a case where I have to accept that this was my journey and um, I made bad decisions and we all make bad decisions. And um, I'm very fortunate that mine weren't a hell of a lot worse or I, I was in worse situations and I have a lot, and to be grateful for so much as well, you know. Mm. That beginning of your career, whether you knew it as the beginning of your career or not, age 12 or 13, being an entrepreneur, being an editor and publisher, and then being at, at the age we are now, being an editor and, and publisher, that feels yeah. like a really strong through line. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, I always sort of try to remind myself, you know, through the stuff, you know, in my 20s and 30s and stuff, it, it sort of gives me that edge. But more importantly, I've learned a lot, a lot about life in general. And I hope anyway that it has made me a stronger and hopefully better person coming through the other side um but yeah i mean that's not for me to say that's for other people there's, there's actually a lot of people will probably say still an asshole you know? <laughs> <laughs> well there's always there's always going to be somebody who says that about all of us but yeah. actually i think i think getting comfortable with that knowledge was personally really helpful to me that not everyone is going to like you and and yeah. t- turning up with the message that is true to you with the thing that you feel you can contribute to the universe regardless yeah. of the fact that some people are going to think you're an asshole because that's just statistics you know that's <laughs> somebody is going to not like whatever the law of say. averages <laughs> yeah completely you know it's 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 about it's about having that that confidence to i mean for, for me confidence is focus it is curiosity it is being about the message not the messenger yes. and doing that is so important which brings me actually to another link speaking from the coaching of writing and speakers point of view yes um I one of the most exciting things of my teens was when I phoned my favorite radio station to correct my favorite DJ on some misinformation he had provided about the Beatles because I am a (laughs) massive massive Beatles fan and I had an absolutely lovely conversation with him and he said you've got a really good voice do you want to be a DJ and I said oh you know, I'd never, yeah. I'd never thought about it, but I, I didn't become a DJ, but I did remember that that was lovely. And I think subconsciously, I also remembered that the reason it was lovely was it was, like I say, the message, not the messenger. I was really interested in what I was saying. I was enjoying who I was talking to. So creating that audience in my head yes. and then talking to them, which is what I do with public speakers now, which is what I'm doing when I'm writing or coaching writing. I'd be really interested to know what that's like for you. Do you create an audience a specific audience person in your head do you do the ideal audience thing when you're speaking when you're writing do you do stuff like that or how is that for you when i'm writing uh, a lot of the time i'm writing for myself if that makes sense i'm i i write the sort of certainly with fiction um when i'm writing fiction i'm certainly writing the type of stories that i would like to read myself which maybe isn't um, from a marketing point of view or from sort of, you know, a point of view of appealing to a bigger, wider audience. It's probably not a good thing. But um, I've always sort of written stuff that I would like to read myself or stuff that I think is cool or scary or, you know, there's a good point to it or it actually it's meaningful, you know, in terms of fiction. Um, But regarding, um, you know, um, speaking in public and stuff like that, I actually find um, the, doing radio or podcasts very easy um, to do. The reason being is because I can't see the audience in front of me, especially if it's pre-recorded then, you know. <laughs> um, yeah. But I would get very nervous um, whenever I'm speaking in public and I can see the people in front of me. I've done a, a bit of you know live theatre. I've also done um, stand-up comedy. Um, although only one gig to be fair it was part of a, a workshop but it was in front of a crowded bar of people and it was very nerve-wracking um, so um, I, ha- I I find that yeah 
Um, regarding doing it yeah, in public, I, I mean, I made a speech at my sister's wedding um, last year, and I thought it would be a walk in the park. But whenever I get up, I was very nervous. Now, I got through it, and uh, it, it comes across quite well. But um, inside, I'm very sort of panicky and sort of, you know, that sort of thing. Maybe I'm just a good bluffer. Um, a lot of people think that I'm actually, um, you know, because of a talk, you know, I've done, you know, live theater and stuff and I do radio and stuff like that. A lot of people um, I, I think um, mistakenly, I believe that I'm actually a very confident person. I'm not, I'm really not. Uh, I'm a lot more confident than I used to be, but um, you know, for sort of reasons that we've already discussed, but I, I'm actually quite, uh, I'm, I'm not very confident person at all, but I do find that um, whenever something is coming up where I have to perform or speak in public, I, I literally just in my mind force myself to do them and just think it's not going to, you know, this is not life or death. This is not the end of the world. And you, more, more times than enough, it works out fine. Mm. It's so interesting hearing what it's like in other people's heads for this because what you've just described of what other people might see is different yes. to how it feels. I I so recognise, I'm sure every everybody recognises. And I, I I remember being outside at the coronation uh street party we had and a yes. guy who lived across from us hearing that I was a confidence coach essentially made the assumption that confidence was something I felt I had. Yes. And maybe other people didn't. Yeah. And the idea that it was a life skill, like writing is a life skill, like speaking is a life skill, and so on, yeah. was so far from where he was hearing it. And this this is something that I, I do see a lot, that people forget that, yes, they've got their entire internal lives going on the whole time, but so is everybody else. You know, you're never the only one that's going, oh, dear God, I can't do this. Here are the 27 things that could go wrong in the next second. Yeah. <laughs> We're all doing it. And I, I think for me, that's the freedom is when you realise that everyone else is just as imposter syndrome filled and nervous as yeah. you could ever be. That, yeah. of course, we look confident to other people the same way they might look more confident than they realize to somebody else and I, I just think it's celebrating what you've got to say yeah and being a vehicle for that isn't it you know you, you're putting Absolutely. something into the world and I suppose it's like anything the more you do something the better you get at it hopefully anyway you know so with me although I haven't done any acting or sort of live performance in a while and I pre-record my radio shows um for me, yeah, it's, it's a case of, you know, practice makes perfect and you get better at these things. But, yeah, a lot of people would have been um, sort of over the years would have been under the sort of illusion that I was a very confident, probably because I'm quite loud as well and sort of, you know, <laughs> I give off an impression of confidence, but it's it, it, it's an act, it's, it's a mask, you know. <laughs> but, again, it's, again, it's one, you know, it's a process. I'm getting there eventually, you know, and it's, it's a case of just with every time you do something like speaking in public, speaking at a wedding or at sort of a book launch or whatever, you'll get better at it and you'll learn. And it's a case of, like you say, um, remembering that we're all in the same boat. You know, there's nobody sort of over there in the corner judging me harshly, making notes, you know. <laughs> you know? And, also, and also on the rare occasions they are, it says so much more about them than it does about you. Well, this is place. it. This is true, you know. Mm. and so Their insecurity. Yeah, yeah. So it's about really being, you know, again, it's throughout my whole life, it's about being more relaxed within myself and with myself and accepting myself, you know, and for many years I didn't. In fact, I didn't know who I was or what I was or what I was meant to do in this life or whatever. And, um, you know, I was sort of, I was lost. I was a lost soul in, in many ways, but uh, ultimately I had to go back to who I was to actually find myself and find meaning in my life and but you know it's I'm not unique we're all in the same boat you know um you know while we all have different journeys we are all ultimately in the same boat you know I know it sounds a bit corny and cheesy you know you have to find yourself you know <laughs> I know yeah I agree you know but that but it, 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 it really is true you know I'm so interested in the find yourself versus create yourself vocabulary because they're both yeah. true 
And in, in a way, a bit like writing a story, it can feel like exactly the same thing. The word that I use is transcribing. When I'm yes. writing and I'm really in, in the flow, really in the zone, it does feel like it used to when I was typing up the interviews that I'd done for my local magazine and my first job, where you're transcribing what you hear. And yeah. it can absolutely feel like that. So whether you're creating the story or finding it or whatever it is, getting yeah. that freedom of curiosity is just the best thing in the world. It, yeah, absolutely. It's the best thing. Oh, I was going to ask you about masks. You mentioned masks. Yes. Um, so I'm going to say two contradictory things about masks, if that's okay. Yeah. You know the comedy and tragedy symbol of theatre, which I wear, and theatre was my background. Yeah. I grew up yeah. in. I I love those symbols, and I remember how freeing it could be to put on a mask and enhance your movement and do things that I found I. When I was training, I, I found it easier to do it with the mask than without. However, the mask, I can also find as a symbol counterproductive to what I want people to find it in themselves. So the thing that I do, whether my actor or speaker is a six-year-old or a 70-year-old, yeah. I, I draw this face from sideways on. I don't know if you remember the Happy Eater logo from... Yeah, yeah, ago, thanks But for, yeah. you remember that face, the going, ah, like that, yeah. like a big smile. I draw that side-on face with a little yeah. number one in the middle of the head at the side, and then a number two pointing to the face, and then a number three pointing to the mouth, because it starts the feeling inside you. And that feeling will leak onto your face and that feeling will leak into the world. So it's not a case of sticking a mask and go, I'm perfectly happy and confident. You know, <laughs> it's about it coming through from you within. from within. But at the same time, I have experienced how how a mask can absolutely work. And I'm reminded, because I know we both like David Bowie, of yes. that that story that that he that that was going doing the rounds about how he spoke to a child about confidence and said, this is my invisible mask that I put on and I'm absolutely safe behind this mask and I choose what goes out into the world. So I can completely see yeah. that they can be useful. But I think, again, it's about finding what works for you, isn't it? Oh, oh absolutely, yeah. And uh, David Bowie also, there's a brilliant quote by David Bowie as well. I know you collect quotes where he talks about ageing and he says ageing is this incredible process where you finally become the person that you're supposed to be. I'm paraphrasing, I could be wrong there, but it's a great quote. But yeah, the whole mask thing, it's, uh, yeah, it's, yeah, I mean, you know, I think we all, to certain extents, wear masks in different aspects of our life, you know, whereas, you know, my family will see a different version of Trevor, whereas, you know, my work colleagues will see a different version. But then the real is that a hat or is that a mask? Because to me, that's a hat. Yeah, yeah. Well, you that's, know, I'm that's still fair here. I'm still yeah. here. I'm yes. still me. Yes. Yeah. No, that's a fair comment. Yeah. You know, and and how how my best friends see me is probably different to the way each other see yes. me. How my partner yes. sees me. How my mum sees me. They're all like the more of yourself you're comfortable with and can bring into the room, the yes. more true that 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 sort of universal Rachel, that universal trope. No, no, that's that a fair comment. With. Yeah. No, definitely. Yeah. But uh, but yeah, for year for many years regarding you know masks, yeah, mm. I, I was very much you know sort of you know pretending to be uh, you know mm. dealing with life and stuff, and it was really I pretended to be confident, you know, um, not even so you know consciously pretending to be confident, you know. Mm. So I would certainly, uh, yeah, I've worn a sort of many masks over the years, you know. <laughs> I've I don't know if I should tell this story, but it's fascinating and it's relevant, and I'm I'm going to go for there it. Was, there was a friend I won't say who and I won't say where, but many years ago, who told me about the loud laugh that I would hear him do in the bars and how it was completely not real that he'd learnt to blend in, and he that was the way that he it sort of did the job of confidence without yeah. it being linked to what was inside. Yeah. And I never forgot that. And then I, I see people who do, I think, their, their sense of self, rather than it be with the writing or the thing that comes yes. out of them, it does tend to be about being seen to be doing those things. And I think it did stay with me as a warning. Yeah. And and that's that's why that George Harrison quote means a great deal to me about when when George decided he he wanted to find something that did the job of drugs, 
but better well, without the drugs. And through himself, but without the drugs that was exactly yeah. it and that was how he got into transcendental meditation or rather how he was ready for it when the opportunity came along yeah yeah that's it and there's something uh, in that isn't there Find, finding in yourself what you need to connect to and that is what allows your work to to enhance itself each time that curiosity to continue that's it yeah absolutely need external stimulation or external validation but e even you what you mm -hmm. mentioned about your uh, friend you know with the, the laugh in the bar mm -hmm. um one thing i again as i was saying earlier on you know most of, practically all of the other kids were in the more sort of cool stuff and like you know football and sports and you know all that whereas i wasn't so uh, and I wasn't very good at football or or other sports, but one thing I did learn from a very early age was one way that you could be accepted um, was by being the class clown. So that I then, but you know, don't get me wrong, it's, it was you know I like a laugh as well. You know, everybody does. Uh, well, most people. <laughs> but so um, what, one of my masks was very much um, being, and still to a certain extent is was very much being the sort of class clown, the joker in the pack, because, you know, make people laugh, you're popular, um, you know, that sort of thing. Um, so that would be certain uh, another aspect of it. But, but again, as I've grown older, sometimes, it, it, you know, it's okay to be a fully rounded human being, grumpy at times, and, you know, you don't have to be, you know, laughing and joking all the time. It's not... It's it would be that would be weird for a start <laughs> and annoying. <laughs> yes, and that's where toxic positivity can also come in, isn't it? Where yeah. there's no such thing as positivity if you don't acknowledge negativity. Absolutely, absolutely. Becomes... I remember there was an episode of The Simpsons where Ned Flanders um had to get he had to be treated in a hospital because he was always being so nice and he had to learn that um uh, that it was okay to be obnoxious sometimes and it was okay to be human essentially <laughs> you know? and it was it was the vocal tick wasn't it you know how he always does the i can't even Oakley, Oakley, yeah. Oakley, Oakley, that was it <laughs> thank you and they worked out in that episode that that was that was actually a tick that was i'm so yes. used to having to be positive yes and that's what those unreal loves or those unreal gestures are about when it's, it's a, not it's a very clever it. episode back when the simpsons was very clever and cutting edge you know yeah. back back in the 90s that's right. oh, so much yeah 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 Brilliant. So it's yeah, so that it's very much resonates with you know certainly with myself where you know it's okay to be human, and it's okay as well for people in our lives to be human as well. And sometimes we we'll have to sort of maybe let things go with people, you know, and just mm -hmm. say, oh, you know, because we're all flawed and we're all on this journey, sort of where we're you know trying to just get through our day sometimes, and that's okay, and that's you okay, know? absolutely. I'm going to ask you about writing and what works for you. With with me, just yes. as a kickoff, the the journaling in the morning, the sort of palate cleansing is yes. a really good way in. As, not going to lie, is the coffee, all of the rituals sort of yeah. gets, gets me into the zone. What is your getting into the zone ritual and what is writing life like for you? Um, essentially, um, to be honest, a lot of the writing I do these days is non-fiction, you know, reviews and stuff like that. However, generally, um, my writing life on a sort of typical writing day will be, um, get up, um, in the morning, you know, get some to eat, um, reply to emails, stuff like that, get myself sorted out for the day. So everything is organized. Um, however, I would, um, have to say I'm, I'm very much a vampire, and a night owl, Nosferatu, in fact, um, whereas I like working late at night and right, indeed, um, I'm not as bad as used to be because I'm sort of back working on a regular job now, but I could, I can easily work through the night, uh, maybe to seven um, in the morning and stuff like that. I would have no problem with things like, you know, two o'clock and four o'clock in the morning in the past, you know, right through to, you know, up to seven o'clock in the morning. Um, I just find there, there's less distractions then. Um, and also, uh, I can just sort of really knuckle down and go at it. It's not healthy at all. It um, messes with my sleeping pattern um, and also my eating pattern. And in fact, during the lockdowns, I was doing that a lot. And during the winter lockdowns, I wasn't seeing daylight at all for quite a while. And it was really unhealthy for my mental and physical health. Um, 
So yeah, not I, I don't recommend it. Um, but these days I'm a lot more relaxed um, and a bit more sort of chill. Where with back working in a, in a regular sort of day job, although it's only part time, it's got me into a, a good routine. I'm sort of I'm being a bit more sensible. However, I believe I do my best work in at night and in the evening. Although going to bed at a bit of an earlier time than before, <laughs> a bit earlier than before. I'm really curious about this because I I did go through a phase where I think as we all do with insecurity going oh a real writer because we all say that about the thing that isn't ourselves does it at night you know and I'm, a, yeah. I'm definitely a daytime creative person and my my ex-partner was like you was was he he would write through the night that was his time for that yeah and I got into the insecurity comparison fairies sort of land where you go yes. that's a proper writer and I'm not I I now know what I was doing there and that it is not true that one is yeah. necessarily better than the other but would you say it's also true that one isn't necessarily worse than the other? I mean, how much of this is just different? How, where, I guess what I mean is where where is the line for you between yeah. this is me and this is an unhealthy extension of that yeah. process? No, no, I, taking I, it to its illogical conclusion. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We all have our own. It's just a strange that you should say about that um, you sort of felt that you should have been an, um, a sort of nighttime writer as well. Mm-hmm. I always viewed, uh, I still do to a certain extent, that um, a real writer, a professional writer, gets up um, at 8 a.m. and um, logs onto their computer at 9 a.m. and works maybe to 5 o'clock in the evening and then that's their, you know, like a sort of day job, you know, sort of thing. So I would sort of look at it from the opposite sort of side of the clock, if that makes sense. See, that's Uh, part of our creativity, isn't it? We can always write perfectly clear narratives for why somebody else is the real one and we're not. (laughs) That's it. That's it. Always sort of having a pop at ourselves Essentially, well, why why am I not like such and such? But uh, yeah, uh, again, yeah, uh, whatever works for you know ourselves uh, might not work for other people, and vice versa. And that's cool. That's okay. Uh, with so where, my... Where's the line? Like, because there must be some of that that is genuinely healthy for you, and yes. some of that that isn't. So, how do you find? How do you know what you're aiming for as as a balance? I find um, to keep a diary. Um, um, really help to be organized essentially and um, and while sometimes I can maybe be overloaded with work certainly in recent times I have been sort of spread myself too thin it's about time management which is something again I'm always I need to improve on but I'm a hell of a lot better than I was um, not so much I mean it was a case of, I'm quite generally quite good at managing time but what I do have to watch is spreading myself too thin and taking too much on and um you know uh, because then the work suffers and then you know you can often sort of then let people down and stuff like that and um i'm not making my own deadlines and, and other things like that um so yeah it's very much about for myself being organized keeping a diary and saying well today i'm going to be working on such and such tomorrow i'm going to be working on such and such but more importantly, you can keep all the diaries in the world. It's sticking to them, <laughs> you know, mm. and <clears throat> that is the, the real trick. And sticking to them, and you know, actually working to a routine. And I love routines, and I love sort of you know, I've again, I've long suspected that I may be, at least in part, I don't know, um, autistic, uh, because I, I'm no expert. I would just like to say that I'm not a medical expert, but I believe I have certain traits where I find an, an attraction with lists and, you know, I'm certainly, you know, I have OCD traits and stuff like that. So I don't know. It's not important, but um, what is important is that um, time management and sort of organization is a major factor for me and the most important, but yeah. So if somebody wanted to experiment with that, who wasn't already doing it and wanted to start doing that diary, what would you maybe point them in the direction of to make that diary work for you? Balance. It's all about life is all about balance. And um, if you go, if you do things to an extreme, anything, you will burn out and other aspects of your life will suffer. So it's it's really about balance. And remember to um, have some downtime to go out and see friends or enjoy yourself, go to the cinema 
and you know socialize and things like that. I I think life in its entirety is about balance, even with diet and stuff like that. Um, sleeping, um, sleep at a normal time. Get, get into a good routine of sleeping and eating at at, at the correct times. Because I know from my own personal experience, from not doing that. Um, I mean, I worked night shift as well in previous jobs, so that really does a number on your sleeping and eating patterns, you know. Um, but I mean, sometimes you know certain things, you know, within life, you know, just have to be done, and you just have to grin and bear it. But in general terms, get into a good sleeping and eating routine and um, balance things out within your at all aspects of your life, diet, you know, sleeping, work, um, <clears throat> sort of, you know, um, socializing, everything. And <clears throat> again, uh, but don't be too hard on yourself if you have days where you don't quite stick to the plan and you just sort of, I don't know, just chill out in front of the TV for a while or something. That That's okay too. Be kind, be strict with yourself, but also at times you have to be kind to yourself as well. And, um, but whenever you are working, work hard and, mm. you know, get the job done. And once you've done it, you will feel that great job satisfaction. Mm. That's, that's really good advice. And maybe scheduling in the downtime. Absolutely. Within that diary so that yeah. you have to do it because it's there. Absolutely. And I would also recommend, um, just what we spoke about it before, uh, meditation. Yes. Uh, back when I was... Back to David Lynch, where we were. Yeah. <laughs> when I was, I'll just be honest, when I was in rehab in the 20s, um, they had meditation classes. And I was 25, and I must admit, a very immature 25-year-old. And I, I was just like laughing in the meditation classes and thought it was all a bit silly. I was wrong. I was an asshole. Meditation is great, um, so it is, and um, I have my own sort of way of doing it. Um, I don't know. I mean, I'm again, I'm no expert, but um, and I don't do it as much as I should do. But um, what I do is for an hour every so often, I will switch off my phone, switch off my laptop, all distractions, and just lie on top of the bed and listen to the open the window and listen to the sounds of you know outside, you know, with the birds chirping dogs you know barking in the in the background and i just find it really really sort of great for my head and um just great for sort of then once i've done that for about an hour i feel so refreshed mentally and physically as well and um, more importantly calm within myself and again i mean that the way i do it might not work for other people i mean because i just basically made that up as a go along you know that form of doing it but I would definitely um, recommend at least looking into it. Mm. Meditation. I came from. I come from a background where sort of you know lads don't do stuff like that. That's all happy, happy nonsense, you know. And you know, and uh, mm. but I have learned that actually meditation is great. And like writing, and like working with writing prompts, meditation is something you also can't do wrong. Yeah, that, do, that doing it at all going yeah. through that process benefits you because I mean I'm sure you've you've seen and, and heard people respond to writing prompts and there will usually be somebody in the room going I don't know if I did it right and yeah. when you're coming to meditation I I've seen exactly those same feelings that what if I'm doing it wrong or my mind yeah. went sideways at that point and the answer is you're there you've stepped into your mind and into your own private world and you're exploring it's not a case yeah. of right and wrong it's a case of be there and experience it and just see what happens on the other side. And whatever works for each individual, you know, yeah. um, definitely. Yeah. So definitely. I would strongly, um, I've, I've actually come on quite a journey where I went from sort of being that 25 year old idiot who would have sort of thought, oh, this is a bit silly type thing to now um, recommending meditation. Definitely. You know, um, for everyone. And being in a room with David Lynch after that must have been pretty rewarding. Well, yeah, absolutely. Well, well, well at the David Lynch sort of event, uh, don't get me wrong, well, um, myself and the people in the audience, you know, back then we certainly weren't scoffing at David Lynch, you know, with the meditation. But we were, we were there first. I was there anyway, first and foremost, as a fanboy of his films and Twin Peaks and stuff. So uh, uh, David Lynch was a complete gent. 
and he realized that and he indulged us in our and answered all the questions. He was an absolute gentleman. So he was he, he was brilliant and so interesting to listen to. And he does this thing where he talks with his hands and he does, you know, and it's you know, I'm sure you've seen it in interviews, and <laughs> it was just great to sort of listen to him. And I would say as well, he's very relaxing to listen to, you know. And um, you could sort of just listen to him sit there and almost become hypnotized and listen to him all day. Great. Yeah. My favorite moment, I was watching a a, a course that he had pre-recorded. And you know how it's all in that glorious monotone. Yes. And he said, when it comes to writing, I like to write. And then he burst out giggling because he realized what he'd said. Yeah. (laughs) That that was the advice. Actually, right. And then I thought, you know what, as with everything about meditation, you're absolutely right in the end. That is the advice. Do it rather than think it's going to all be. So, you know, it it really can't be as simple as that, though. That's like, like pure simplicity, you know. And sometimes, I would say a lot of the time, if we approach everything in life in simplistic, practical, logical terms, yeah. it works. Don't over don't overcomplicate things. <laughs> you know, if it if it works, do do it that way. If it doesn't work, find yeah. something else that will, <laughs> because it will in the end. Yeah. <laughs> Are there any other writing exercises, prompts, things that you do that help you? Not necessarily for any particular kind of writing, but just at all. What 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 are the toys that might work for you? Um, Self discipline. Uh, I know that's not really. That's more of a sort of mindset. Um, you know, um, that certainly helps me. I have. I don't know. I, I've never suffered from writer's block because any time I've like been think, oh, I'll maybe write a story or whatever. Uh, but what I do, and I learned this from David Lynch. That that day I was in the audience, you know, listening to David Lynch. David um, Lynch was asked a question by one of the audience members about, um, I, can't, I can't even remember the guy's question, but um, David Lynch recommended, um, it might even be, have been to do with the question, just generally what he was talking about. David Lynch, was talk, he was talking about writing, and he said to always carry a notebook about with you, a notebook and a pen. And um, so basically any ideas you have, which can happen when you're, um, basically on a bus or going to the toilet or, you know what I mean, the most random of times you'll get these um, ideas. But he said um, you need to write them down straight away so you don't lose any of them. And I, that has always stuck by me. So I have basically pages and pages of story ideas that I can always go back to. And again, I learned that off David Lynch. And he also said to do the same with your dreams. Um, whenever you wake up and sort of, um, you know, write them down straight away, you know, that sort of thing. These days now you can, um, I say these days, it was only like 15 years ago, but now we can sort of, if we have an idea, instead of, you know, getting our notepad out, we can sort of text it to ourselves or mm-hmm. put it into our phones. But definitely um, always write down, um, make a note of your ideas. Yeah, don't let the fish swim away. A hundred percent. And uh, yeah, uh, definitely. And whatever way you make that note, you know, and uh, however ludicrous the ideas might be, you might use it, you might not, but write it down anyway. Do you remember his jigsaw image about that that I really love? Is he? Um, he's, I he's, may have seen that, yeah. Oh, I love this one, that there's somebody sitting in another room and there's a door between you with a letterbox and the, and the person on the other side of the door will give you one jigsaw piece. And, you, you know, you don't know what this bit of the idea is. You don't know what this jigsaw piece is. But rather than go, this is a rubbish jigsaw piece, what you do is, oh, OK, here's my jigsaw piece. And there'll be another one along in a minute. And you'll start putting the jigsaw pieces together. And you won't necessarily know what it is, but you stay curious and you keep going. And I absolutely love that. And eventually, yep, you get your completed piece. Yep. Yeah. Your completed jigsaw. Absolutely. See, see also everything in life. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. 100%. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for doing this, Trevor. It's been absolutely No problem delightful. at all. My pleasure. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Usually I'm the one doing the interviewing, so it's, it's, it's been great. If you'd like to spend more time at the Writer's Gym, head to the programme notes for this episode's writing workout. Find Trevor Kennedy at Big Hits Radio UK and Phantasmagoria magazine. To pre-order Twisted Branches for October 2023, visit Black Shuck Books.